Hey, welcome back, everybody. Of course, you know me. My name is Dr. Keith McNally. This is Coach's Corner, and I'm here with Suzanne Jabor. Yes, because when she was on the Question Guy podcast, I totally messed that up, but she was gracious enough to let me slide. Suzanne is going to talk about something really critical that we really need to have a conversation around because it costs businesses, you just said, in the billions at cost, what does this cost refer to? So the cost that we were talking about is to businesses that are unable to appropriately acknowledge and support people who are experiencing grief in their workplace. Okay. It's $125 billion annually in the US. It's a lot of money and that cost is productivity, it's turnover, it's people on long-term disability. We can break it down a bunch of different ways. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to get to the um, really nuanced, it's this, it's that little pieces. We can't, it's hard to break down because most companies aren't tracking it appropriately. We track you know, that someone took what they're entitled to, they took their five days, but then we don't track that their productivity dropped, that they took additional sick time, for example, that they they're, they were more absent than normal, that they had presenteeism issues, right? They were there, but not fully engaged and productive. But that number is really big. And as much as for me, I think the number is important. I think what's more important is when we think about what that represents. That represents people in your business and on your teams that are not feeling connected, that are feeling isolated, that their productivity is dropping and nobody's helping them, that are struggling in your workplace because your business has the same gap that all of us have as a collective in that we don't know enough about grief, we don't know how to talk about it, we don't know how to support people through it, and that shows up in your bottom line. So let's talk about real quick how you got here not necessarily in this conversation, but how do you know all this? And how do you know about how to deal with grief in the workplace effectively? Real quick. So I got here just really out of my own curiosity because I heard from grievers over and over and over again, how much their workplace was a problem for them in their grieving process. So then I got really curious about what were people studying? What were the stats? And then what could we do about it, right? I'm all about what can we do? How do we help each other? How do we shift from being empathetic, putting ourselves in someone else's shoes to feeling compassionate and actually wanting to do something and help? And what I discovered was that there's some very simple, low to no cost things that we can do that make a really big difference. And it starts with being able to have a conversation that's not harmful. And then moves to, you know, what tangible supports can we provide in the workplace? When you're sitting at your desk, how can we help you? And what's interesting about it is I, so what I did is I basically broke down the really common symptoms and what can we do to help with that symptom? So it's very common, for example, for people to have grief brain or brain fog. Mm -hmm. One of the things that impacts is your relationship with time. How can we help people manage time? How do we help people manage deliverables? Like all of those things that we can do that really help grievers and also have a ripple effect and help your whole team. <laughs> because one of the benefits is that if you take that spin out of everybody's head, because they know, for example, you know, there's a meeting today where we have to have a bunch of stuff done, that's all documented on our shared drive. There's a calendar notification that's gonna pop up on our computers to remind us to go to the meeting in 10 minutes. All easy things to do, right? technology that we already have in our workplaces that we're not leveraging to help in this way. What it does for the griever is it allows them to know they don't have to worry about that piece. And it does the same thing for everyone else. So everyone else who's functioning well gets to function on a different level because they're not having to think about those little detail-y kind of things that is not what you want them to be doing. We want them creating and innovating and problem solving. We don't want them worrying that they have to remember the meetings at two. Earlier you said we don't know how to have conversations around grief in the workplace. And mm -hmm. I've had other calls who would callers that would agree with you. Bosses aren't trained, managers aren't trained, executives aren't trained, coworkers yeah. aren't trained. It's not part of 
it's not part of the culture in many ways no. in the workplace. And so can that be changed? Not necessarily by policy, but practicality. Can it be changed in application? Yeah, 100% it can be changed through education, right? So one of the things that I do is I offer sort of a grief 101 as part of my programming. So I come in and we talk about grief. How does it really work? What are some of the symptoms? How long does it really take? What does it look like in the workplace? What can be what we be watching for in and amongst each other so that we can be stepping in more proactively helping? And one of the really big shifts we can make that really starts to address that is practicing with losses that happen in the office. So I'm not talking about the losses of people or employees. I'm talking about you know, when your quarter or quarterly earnings weren't what you expected them to be, or when your project launch doesn't go the way that you wanted. And one of the things that I talk about with leadership is how can you presence that there's an emotional component to that, that there's a grief component to that. So what if our debrief meeting, instead of jumping into what went wrong, how do we fix it? How do we pivot? How do we relaunch? Whatever it is, whatever your steps are going to be, all of that, which is valuable and we need to do. What if we started with the leader, because it has to come from the leader, saying something like, we worked really hard on this project. And I want everyone to know that you are still, even though it didn't go the way that we wanted, the most valuable team. And I really need you all to know that, you, that I care about you. And I have a whole bunch of feelings about what happened. I'm feeling disappointed. I'm feeling sad, whatever the feelings are. Does it, and I bet you have some feelings too. If you want to share them, that's great. If you don't want to share them, just know it's okay that you have them. And we're just going to take a minute to feel them and acknowledge them. And then let's pivot and let's relaunch and let's make this the project we know it is. What if you started there? That sounds great, but it sounds weird because yep. very few managers, supervisors, executives are looking to step in and create a space where emotions are validated. Right. And that's a huge problem okay. <laughs> because if we can't even talk about it when we're talking about a project, right. how are you going to talk to someone like me who's a grieving mom coming back to work? Three to five days is the average leave. So three to five days after my child has died, I'm coming back to the workplace. If you can't talk about your disappointment about a project launch, you are not going to be able to talk to me. It's not possible. So we have to practice. It's a muscle we don't have. You're exactly right. We aren't comfortable sharing our emotions. So let's start with the easier places to do that. And it has to come from leadership, right? We can't ask our teams to be more vulnerable and honest than we're prepared to be. And the interesting thing is with emotions, just naming them starts to move them. And we're not talking about like, let's have a deep dive therapy session around the boardroom table. We're not talking about that. But one of the things that I hear from leaders all the time is they want workplaces with very little drama. Fabulous. I am actually proposing something that diminishes the drama. Because if I know as a griever that I can go to my supervisor and say, wow, I'm having a really griefy day. Can we look at that policy together? I'm gonna to need some extra support this week because something's coming up or something's happened, whatever it is. I don't even really need to explain it. I should just be able to access. And we have that conversation. Then we're creating a situation where there isn't gonna be any drama because I'm getting the support I need. Because I've gone and said, wow, I'm a little bit weepy today. So I'm gonna to need to be able to just leave my desk and go for a walk for short periods of time. I'll have my phone with me. You'll be able to get a hold of me. But if I'm not at my desk when you're looking for me, that's what's going on. Then I'm not sitting at my desk crying, surrounded by coworkers who want to help and fix something that's unfixable, creating a bunch of drama. I get to go off, self-regulate. If you think about it, we do it for preschools and kindergartens, right? We have a quiet corner where kids get to go to self-regulate. They get to go to go, wow, I'm overwhelmed. I need to go to the quiet corner and read my book, put on some music, you know, smash things, whatever it is. We probably aren't smashing things in the quiet corner, but every office should have a smash room, I swear. <laughs> right? We create that for little kids because we know they can't always self-regulate. Right. Adults can't always self-regulate either. And sometimes we just need a break and then to be able to come back. And if that's set up ahead of time, there is no drama. And earlier, you, you, I think you gave a really good example that as the leader in front of the, the team, 
that person was the first person to talk about or at least state I'm feeling depressed or whatever or upset or whatever it is, but mostly around the fact that the project didn't go according to plan or at least the outcomes <laughs> weren't were as expected. To hear somebody in leadership identify an emotion and a feeling how does that change the scope of that team? And have you experienced that space before? Yeah, I mean, what it does is it gives everyone permission as much as they want and as much as they feel safe to do to really be their whole selves hmm. and to name what's true. Because the amount of energy that we're expending not saying what's true, I think is part of that $125 billion. Yeah. because we're spending all that energy putting on a face and pretending everything's okay while you're sitting days at your desk getting nothing done. Whereas if you could go and say, I'm really struggling today. I absolutely want to be here and I have some deliverables I need to get done and I'm committed to doing those, but I'm going to need some extra support or I'm going to need a timeout or you know whatever it is. And hopefully that's in a policy that's documented. There's options to choose from this menu of supports. Then we're creating a place where people know that it's safe or that's the intention, right? And we need to practice that, right? We are, This is breaking down some taboos in the workplace for a lot of workplaces. Some of them are already doing many things like this, right? Where we're having honest conversations about how we're doing. But if that's new for you, yes, it's going to feel scary. It's going to feel awkward. And you can set it up that way, right? I was listening to this great podcast and they were talking about how it would be really healthy when we're disappointed to say so. What if we tried that? Like no drama about it. We just get to say, you know what? I'm really disappointed about that. And then we carry on. We just name it because just the naming of it moves it. Just the naming of it makes it better. And yes, it's a change. It's a change that's long overdue. You know, we've been studying emotional intelligence now. You know, my daughter's 29. We were talking about it when she was in elementary school. So that's decades. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to use what we've learned in order to reduce that 1.25 billion? No, not 1.25, 125. 125, that's even larger. It's even worse. I can't even really conceptualize how much that is, but it's, it's the human capital part to me that's even more important. Yes, we're businesses, we care about the bottom line, but our bottom line is driven by our people. And if we can take exceptional care of our people, that's always gonna be better for our bottom line. Well, then for the leaders who are listening and are really in tune with what you are saying, give them something to do today that they can apply tomorrow at work in terms of having those conversations and being able to talk about an emotion or emotions to use your word in order to move them. Yeah. So there's two things you can do. Uh, one of them is to start those kind of meetings with that conversation. Or have a meeting where you say, you know what, I realize we have this gap and I haven't been sharing what's going on for me. We're coming out of the most, well, I was, we're not even coming out of it. We are in the most tumultuous time as humans, I think that we've ever been in. And there's a whole lot of emotions about that, a whole lot of feelings about that, regardless of anything demographic about you. We're all having a whole lot of big feelings. <laughs> so what if you said, you know what, what if we have... 15 minutes on Monday where we come in first thing in the morning and we get to just, if we choose say, wow, I'm really feeling disappointed about some things that are going on. I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling happy. They don't have to all be heavy, big emotions. They can be, I had this amazing weekend and I want to share it with you how excited I am about this thing that's coming up. That's an emotion too. We're more comfortable sharing those. If we can share the disappointments, if we can share the sadness, if we can share the frustration, we move it, it goes. We aren't holding onto it. That's malignant. It's bad for our bodies to hold onto it. We have to figure out how to move it. And this is one of the ways we can. So as a leader, you can initiate those conversations with no expectation that anyone else is going to play along until you've done it a lot of times, because you're going to have to build everybody else's sense of safety. And you do that by example. The other thing that you can do is if you're thinking about someone in your organization that has experienced grief or loss is go to them and say, you know what, I, 
guess, I'm pretty sure I didn't say anything very helpful. And it's just because I didn't know any better. What I want you to know is you're a really valuable part of this organization and we want you to be grieving and successful at work at the same time. So what can I do that we're not doing now that would make that easier for you? I would love to see that happen, actually. Right? I've never experienced, well, I've never been in a situation where that would be an experience, but I've not heard anybody really disclose that that's actually happened to them in the workplace. And so that would be a really significant change that needs to happen. Wow. Because what happens in the workplace is you've said something awkward and uncomfortable, and probably from that list of platitudes and cliches that are all have a subtext that does harm. So we're just never going to say those again. Mm. But you get to have a redo, right? People are very forgiving when you're honest about making a mistake. And if you just say, you know, I don't, I, I understand now that being a griever in the workplace is really hard. And I'm so appreciative that you show up every day and that you're still here. And what can I do that would make that easier? And have some ideas, because part of what happens with grievers is really open-ended offers like that are really hard to take up because we can't really conceptualize what we need. But if you see something that's changed, changed in their work behavior, like they're missing deadlines, for example, or they're disengaging from their peers when they used to be really involved, or um, they're struggling feeding themselves. Feeding yourself when you're in early grief especially is really difficult. So what if you looked at that and said, you know, I've noticed that you've missed a couple of deadlines lately, and I understand now that's related to your grief. So would it be helpful if we did some documenting of what to do when that was easy for you to access and you didn't have to try and remember it all and the onus wasn't on you to do the documenting? Could we do that for you? Make a specific offer. That works. That works perfectly. Suzanne, I don't think there's any better way of ending the conversation than with that. So I thank you for joining me on Coach's Corner. For those of you who are watching and listening, I'll see you next time. Take care.